Okay, welcome everyone. I've got 1 p.m. on my watch, so we'll go ahead and get started. I'd like to thank you all for coming to the Mixed Method webinar series brought to you by MIRA, Mixed Method International Research Association, as well as International Institute for Qualitative Methodology here at the University of Alberta. My name is Yvette, and I'll be facilitating the webinar today. Um, if you guys can just, uh, you're all on mute right now, and you will be for the duration of the presentation. Um, but there is a chat below where you can enter your questions. Um, if you guys can hear me, if you can maybe just type in hi or hello, maybe where you're from, just so I know that you guys can hear me and that the sound is working well. Perfect. Thanks. Giselle, BJ, Fiza, Miranda. Perfect. Great that you guys can hear me. Um, so as I mentioned before, you'll all be on mute for the duration of the presentation at the end uh, we will have time for questions and answers, at which time you can raise your hand um, and then I can give you the microphone and you can ask your question or if you don't have a microphone you can just type your question into the chat and I will read those out. So today's webinar is Sampling Design and Mixed Methods Research with Kathleen Collins. Kathleen Collins, PhD, is Professor in the Department of Curriculum and Instruction, College of Education and Health Profes uh, Professions at the University of Arkansas. Um, Fayetteville. She publishes and teaches graduate level courses on topics including sampling related to mixed research design. Kathleen, we're very happy to have you here with us today. Oh, thank you very much. I appreciate it. You want me to click? Oh, you did it. Great. Okay. Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, as you know, this, the topic today is sampling design, specifically as it relates to mixed research. Basically, just to give an understanding we'll be just of, of where sampling fits into the methodology, we're going to talk about briefly what is a methodology, a method, what steps comprise the planning and design stage of the mixed research process. Basically, according to Tedley and Tashikori, they interpret methodology as a very broad approach. And basically, it takes into account the individual's world uh, view considerations, their preference for the uh, particular types of design, sampling logic, et cetera. And basically, it gives an indication of the overall methodological orientation of the research. Why this is important for sampling is that basically, your interpretation about what you consider credible data and how you intend to collect and analyze your data is very much relative to your research question impacts the sampling decisions that you make as you go through the process within the research process itself. So who you are as a researcher impact your sampling decisions. And basically, just to give some understanding of the design logic, basically, when we're talking about design, we're talking about timing, integration, the priority that you give to the different components or strands within the study, and that's how you make your decision relative to mixed method study, relative to designing a mixed method study. Why this is important is your sampling design significantly impacts this process. Basically, um, just for terminology, a strand refers to the conceptual understanding of your research purpose in your question, your implementation of methods and analysis, and the inferences that you use when you um, what you, excuse me, what you compose when you look at your results relative to the individual components of the study. Basically, in designing, there are different stages of the research process. The stage we're going to focus on today is stage two, the planning and design stage. And basically, you identify the study's mixed design. You identify the sampling scheme and sample size per phase or per strand. And you ident identify the balance of the sample relative to the study's objective. And by objective, I'm talking about generalization. And overall, throughout this process, you are thinking about and incorporating a validity design, ascertaining that the results that you're acquiring at each stage of the process are valid and contribute towards your understanding of the research question. Basically, a sampling design refers to two decisions. First is the strategy you use to select your sample per phase or per strand and the sample size. The way I'm going to focus on this particular webinar is to introduce an inclusive sampling model. It comes from the Handbook of Mixed Method Research, the second edition. And basically, we're going to be discussing three components of this model. One is the use of sampling typologies as guideposts. 
the use of thinking about the steps in the mixed sampling process and some recommendations to address some issues related to specific criteria, namely your sampling design, representation, legitimation or validity, integration and politics and included within politics or ethics. Basically a sampling design, um, we're gonna be talking about sample schemes and sample size very briefly. Throughout the presentation, I have citations, and at the conclusion of the presentation, you have a listing of these um, citations within the reference list so you can follow up if you have any further questions outside of this particular webinar. Basically, as I mentioned earlier, you have to, it's important to identify who you are as a researcher. Basically, it's influenced by your philosophical assumptions, ontological, epistemological, about what constitutes credible data and to recognize that the data are created by the research and not simply collected. By that I mean, when you look at a situation and you ascertain what to collect and how to interpret that collection of data relative to analysis, it's very much a subjective process. And it's very much filtered by who you are as a researcher in terms of experiences, your qualifications, your beliefs, and your motivation for exploring that particular topic. Some examples um, of, of different decisions and criteria within quantitative. Basically, when you're looking at the aim of the study and sample characteristics are identified, the goal here is to select a representative sample. You identify your target population, you identify the accessible population within the target population, which you have reasonable access to, and then you develop a sampling frame. And that delineates all the elements in the selected population that you would like to, to assess within your study. And basically, you use a probability sampling scheme, and your sample size is determined by a power analysis. One in particular is G-Power. Or you can go to published tables indicating what is the preferred sample size to allow you to have adequate power in order to detect a statistically significant difference. Basically, in qualitative, your goal here is your sampling for meaning. It's very much context specific and it's, it's based experientially, meaning it's not fixed. Relationship between the researcher and the participants can shape how data are collected. The cultures and the community that you're working with can also shape this process. And your goal is to obtain information rich data to allow you to achieve saturation. In other words, you want to acquire enough information that you can draw a credible conclusion based on how you analyze those, the particular data within that particular context. Okay, data saturation. Data saturation is the term indicating that you have obtained enough information based on the sample in front of you that you can draw some credible conclusions. If not, then you will go back and resample until you can draw those credible conclusions. Factors that influence saturation is the amount and the complexity of the type of data that you collect. The heterogeneity of the sample. If the sample shares specific characteristics that are it's more likely you will get to saturation sooner because they have a similar perspective, different facets of that perspective, but they have a similar perspective. For example, teachers, they all share an educational background. Principals, they share an educational background, but they're administrators. Um, also, the number of individuals who are analyzing and interpreting the data. The more researchers interpreting the data is going to take longer to get to saturation because we all bring our individual experiences and beliefs to the table when we're actually doing the analysis. So it will take longer to come to some type of consensus. The larger the degree of sample heterogeneity and the larger number of cases are recommended to achieve saturation. In other words, the wider the spectrum of characteristics within your sample, the more likely we'll have to have more cases, individuals, individual site in order to achieve saturation. This article by Guess is an excellent source. It's Guess, Bunsen, Johnson. They go into detail about recommendations in order to achieve saturation. Um, here, objective here is generalization. Basically, there are different types. When I say objective, the objective of your study is what type of generalization do you want to achieve given the, the restrictions on the sample that you selected, the types of data collected, and to whom do you intend to generalize your results to? Probability sampling tends to be external generalization. You select a representative sample and you generalize to a population. Purposive sampling can be internal generalizations. Here, you may take a subset of your group that, you're, that you have sampled 
and they are um, considered to be an elite informants. They're representative of the sample, but they have been selected specifically as representative of the sample. And then you would then generalize to that from what they say to the sample as a whole. Analytic, here you're looking at the evidential quality of the data. Here you generalize a particular set, case study, to some broader theory. An example might be um, learning disabilities. Um, individuals with learning disabilities, although they share a label or a definition, they, they're very heterogeneous in their, in their particular display of behaviors. So you would select strategically individuals who have a learning disability, and then based on the results, you would then apply the results to some broader theory about a learning disability. Case-to-case -case transfer. Here you, you generalize across cases, and the transfer is supported by theory. Naturalistic comes from the work of State, 2005. Here, the perceptions of the consumers of the research reflect on the applicability of your finding to their individual experiences. So the point I'm trying to get at here is there are different types of generalizations besides just external generalization. Rationale and purpose. Here, you, the rationale for developing the sampling design is filtered by, obviously, the research question, the type of generalization that you intend to use, and your resources. From a quantitative perspective, you want to obtain adequate power, population, and you want to make sure the population characteristics are represented in the sample. From a qualitative perspective, again, you want to obtain quality data to retain saturation and theory development, as in the case of grounded theory or theory confirmation. So some strategy that you can use to ascertain the characteristics are represented is you can do some type of brief briefing interviews to guide sample selection. This, again, has to be appropriate given the design parameters. In mixed research, the sampling design per phase can facilitate or limit the inferences that you make. And basically, the degree that you can make inferences relative, relative to what was developed by the quantitative phase and what was developed from the qualitative phase. You make a determination. And the determination is based on the degree that the sampling design supports the credibility of these inferences. For example, is it credible to survey 100 individuals through questionnaire data, run quantitative analyses, and then take a subset of 10 and do a qualitative analysis, a more in-depth interview process? 100 versus 10. It can be considered interpretive consistency if you have indicated what type of generalization you wish to make based on that particular sample. As I mentioned earlier, if the individuals, the 10 that are representative of the, of the population, you could make some type of internal generalization. In other words, what that group said to you, the 10, can be generalized just to that particular sample as a whole. Um, the Inclusive model was based on pre-existing published uh, typologies. And basically the references for the development of these typologies can be seen in columns 2010. And basically these typologies form the basis for the integrative typology that I'm gonna present in the, next, in the following slides. The integrative typology is designed to give you guideposts on to think about how sampling is influencing your mixed research design. And basically, it's the relationship between the samples, quantitative and qualitative, and the time orientation. Is it concurrent? In other words, is, the in, is there independence between the quantitative and the qualitative phases, and the integration or mixing occurs at the conclusion only? Or is it sequential? The qualitative phase was done initially, and based on the results of the analysis of the qualitative phase, information is used to develop the quantitative phase. In other words, there's a dependent relationship between the two. The relationship between the quantitative and qualitative samples. How do they interrelate relative to, excuse me, relative to um, selection process? The relationship between the combination of schemes that you use and the type of generalization that you're making. The relationship between varying types of data collected and the research question. And the relationship between the emphasis of the approach, is it approximately equal? In other words, you're drawing conclusions from both and treating them of equal importance when you respond to the research question? Or is there a preference given to one versus the other based on the parameters of the particular design? Okay, I just mentioned here, concurrent versus sequential is the time orientation. I mentioned that earlier. 
the relationship between the samples. Identical means that the same participants participated in the quantitative phase and the qualitative phase. Parallel means the participants differ, but they share similar characteristics. All are teachers or all are principals. Nested means you take a subsample, 10 from the 100, um, that subsample from the sample in the first phase in order to develop, uh, collect data rather, in this phase two. Multi-level means that the samples have a different relationship with the variable of interest. For example, principals, teachers, parents, students. What they share is a perception about education, but they have different levels of engagement with education. You can probably tell I'm in on my area is education. So a lot of my um, examples are from that area. The types of data collected. You can collect quantitative data and qualitative data. You can transform data, sometimes referred to, actually now referred to as crossover analysis. In other words, you collect quantitative data, but you structure the analysis such that you're able to incorporate qualitative techniques in order to un, uh, analyze the quantitative data or vice versa. And um, these are some examples of what's a quantitized process and what's a qualitized process. The emphasis of approach. Here you're making some type of emphasis on where you would like to place your um, type, the types of conclusions that you're drawing and how strongly you're using that data to support these conclusions. And sometimes you make you do some type of saturation or representative saturation trade-off. In other words, you trade off between meeting external generalization, and that would be relative to um, a sample that's representative of the population. Or you're thinking more about transferability, case-to-case -case transfer. That decision will influence the type of the sample number and the strategy that you will use in order to collect your data. The emphasis. Here again, I mentioned to what degree are you giving dominant emphasis to one versus the other or approximately equal. And then some questions to ask yourself when you're, when you're ascertaining what sample design will I use, and again, sample design is the strategy to select your data, excuse me, the strategy to select your participants, the sample size that, again, is influenced by the type of generalization. You want to think about the goal, the long-term aim of the study. Who are the, in, who are the stakeholders? What sample characteristics are you interested in acquiring relative to, in other words, uh, ascertaining, rather, in order to answer that particular research question? The objective of the study. I went through these earlier. Again, these are just questions to guide decision making as you go through the process. And then you have to think about, and this is an important component, how do the sample characteristics impact the purpose of mixing? And what sampling design optimally addresses the purpose of mixing? For example, is, it, is your purpose triangulation? Are you look, looking for convergence? Or are you looking for divergence? Where you're hoping that as a result of your strategic sampling design, you'll be getting different facets of interpretation relative to the phenomenon of interest. You don't necessarily want them to converge into a similar conclusion. You're looking for divergence. The research question, to what degree will the samples generate enough data, credible data, such that you can address your particular question? Research design. How does the research design impact the type is impacted by the sampling scheme used? And to what degree have you provided rationa rationales for your selection? In other words, it's simply not enough to say I'm doing this. It's, I think it's important to include a rationale for why your decision to use um, random versus purposive sampling scheme should be explained to the reader in terms of transparency and why that particular sample size was selected by you. Did you use a power analysis? Are you looking for strategic um, selection of characteristics? This should be spelled out, written up in the write-up as to what your rationale for your sampling design is relative to each phase of the study. And to what degree have you combined the purposes and probability sampling schemes in your study? In other words, have you been strategic relative to the generalization such that the combination of sampling schemes used for the quantitative and qualitative phases leads up to a conclusion that is credible and responsive to your question. 
There are certain uh, challenges impacting sampling designs. There's representation, legitimation, integration, politics, and ethics. You know, people, oftentimes people say, I have a representative sample. But, and again, a representative sample is a miniature or small replica of the population, or sometimes referred to as typical. However, the typical is, is simply not enough to say typical. It's important to explain what you mean by typical of the population. Is it the average? Is it the modal? The mode or the modal? Is it the ideal or the coverage of a population? Interpretation of coverage is delineated as heterogeneity. In other words, how heterogeneity is reflected in your sample? Or have you included extreme cases? And if so, why? Or could it be partitioning a population into different classes that are homogeneous, but not necessarily represented proportionately? In other words, are you using a stratified sample so that you're encapsulating the characteristics of interest, but recognizing that are not represented proportionately to the overall population as a whole? This would be very much if you're using extreme cases. This is an excellent source for expanding on this particular topic. Representative, start, stating only the term representative assumes that there's a, a seal of approval and that the sample is representative of the target population. But as indicated by the previous slide, much more information is needed other than the words typical or representative. You should elaborate on who exactly is in your sample relative to your selection process. Selection bias. Cultural uh, values define your perceptions of what is representation and the impact, the degree that the individuals are proportional relative to the sample, relative to the population and to your selection process. And sometimes bias can occur, un unintentional bias, using what we refer to as a judgment sample. Basically, you select a sample based on the fact that you believe that sample can give you the information that you need in order to respond to the research question. It becomes problematic when there isn't a theoretical rational, you, you don't have a theoretical framework. In other words, you need to have a theory behind you such that you can ascertain that what you're, what you're looking at can be, can be interpreted through the lens of a theory. It's not simply enough to say there's characteristics. You want to be able to interpret those characteristics relative to the theory that's guiding your particular design. And a convenient sample. I strongly urge you not to use a convenient sample. The problem with a convenient sample, it introduces unwanted variation and unknown variation within your particular study. It is better to take a little longer, per se, and be be more savvy about what you're looking at relative to characteristics. How do these characteristics inform the overall design of, of what you're going to be looking at? And to what degree are these characteristics aligned to your theoretical framework, indicating that these characteristics will give you an understanding based on theory as to what you are looking at based on the type of question that you're asking. Another problem that may occur on unintentional bias is when you're doing observational work. You're assuming just because you're there at that particular time that what you are seeing is continuous whether you're there or not. That might not be the case. Um, there could be Floyd's conclusions because a selective viewing of events and activities might not be representative of the pattern that you're looking at. And the very fact that you're there can influence what occurs within that particular setting. When I was observing in one of the schools, at first they didn't, I came in and people didn't realize that I had a PhD and, and basically my observation went in one direction. Once they knew that I had a PhD and it came up in a conversational tone, all of a sudden the whole dialogue changed within the observational setting. So I realized that my presence had influenced what I was observing and that it wasn't continuous because I had seen it before they realized this information. So the very fact that I was there, it became problematic in order to get a true representation of what was occurring in the setting that I happened to be at. Sampling of bias can also 
happen when, this is again, would be a judgment bias. When you select individuals who are willing to participate, convenient sample, who, or you perceive as articulate, insightful, attractive, and intellectually responsive, and, you, and they're selected because, based on these characteristics. If the, if the participants' perspectives that you have selected are not representative of the actual variability within that particular population, then you have selected a biased sample. A key informant is sometimes is usually selected because he or she has a unique perspective, but they are still representative of the population of interest. But it's important to take into account this could be a misled, misleading judgment call on your part, because they may not be representative of the population. Some, some particular solutions that you can use, sampling bias solutions. For example, M Miles et al. recommend increasing the number of cases and including cases that have alternative perspectives. In other words, seeking out individuals who are not similar to the original selection of cases, giving a broader interpretation of the phenomena of interest. Select a negative case for contrasting purposes. Someone who's so uniquely different that you get a different perspective on the environment as a whole. For example, one of the studies that I did, I was interested in looking at how teachers were informed in their decision making by a particular form of professional development designed to enhance their mathematical teaching skills. The question that I posed was to what degree does this preparation allow them to teach students who have a learning disability? My sample selection was such that I was interested in the teachers who had gone through professional development but I was also interested in seeing to what degree do their personality influence their teaching style. And the third factor that I was interested in, what was the school culture? The individual school culture that they were in, because as you know, culture influences how one behaves in a particular environment. So I selected three individual groups. Teacher A was someone who had gone through the professional development. Teacher B was someone that teacher A had recommended who was very similar in teaching style to teacher A. Here I was looking to see to what degree would they share characteristics, but teacher B did not go through the professional development. Teacher three was someone that teacher A or teacher one felt was so distinctly different from that individual that I, here I was getting a negative case, someone who was distinctly different from the individual that I was interested in assessing. And that third individual would likely give me an indication of what would be the school culture. And I was able, using that sampling strategy, get three distinct perceptions of the phenomena of interest, which is how did uh, professional development influence teacher A? How did teachers A personality influence possibly their, um, their interpretation of that development? And also teacher three, how, how did the school culture play a part in this? Actually, it worked out very well. I published it. <laughs> okay. Legitimation, a term coined by Amway Boozy and Johnson, 2006. This is um, an excellent article. Basically, they developed a typology of different criteria that will allow researchers, once they look at it, to ascertain that they actually have legitimation or validity checks within their design. And they have nine criteria. The one that is of interest to us because of the topic sampling design is sampling integration. The extent to which the relationship between the quantitative and qualitative design, sampling designs, yields quality meta inferences. For example, if you have identical individuals participating in the quantitative and the qualitative strains or phases of your study, you likely will be able to have a higher degree of sampling integration because both sets of individuals are participating in both components of the study. You're not introducing unwanted variation into the design because the same participants, same characteristics are responding to the quantitative and qualitative phases of the study. As you introduce more complexity into the design, the research design, it's important to recognize that you need to address potential biases associated with your sample selection. And a term that has been coined by uh, Collins et al. 2006 is interpretive consistency. This is a validity check. In other words, you want to note to denote or make transparent to your audience the consistency between the inferences made by the researcher and the sampling design. 
In other words, did you overgeneralize? In other words, if you don't have a if you do not have a random sample, is it appropriate to have an external generalization? In other words, by, is it appropriate to generalize from your sample to the population as a whole? These decisions that you make relative to your sampling scheme and your sample size influence the degree that the meta inferences that you draw, which are conclusions from all the different strands of the study, the quality of these inferences, did you collect quality data and analyze it appropriately, and also to what you can you generalize based on your preference for a particular type of generalization. That's referred to as interpretive consistency. Design fidelity. This comes from the work of Tedley and Tashikori, 2009. Design fidelity refers to what degree do the different design components, data collection, data analysis, and sampling technique are executed with the rigor and quality. In other words, does your sampling design support your data collection activities and vice versa? Did you collect an adequate number of individuals, whether it be individual sites or individual persons, such that you can execute the data analysis necessary or preferred in order to address your research question? One of the problems that I see as a review for different uh, journals is individuals do not collect enough data to allow them to use more advanced statistical techniques. In other words, they do not collect enough qualitative data to allow the opportunities to, to quantitize their data using analyses such as factor analysis of the qualitative data, allowing for a broader interpretation or a higher level of meta inference based on what you're looking for within the data, a conclusion of such. In other words, collecting enough data to allow you the opportunity to use a variety of different techniques is an important component. And that, that indicates that you have design fidelity is a match, a concurrence between the sampling design, the data collection activities, the type of data analysis that you wish to execute. And to what degree do these procedures encapsulate the relationships, the association, the effects to allow you to draw credible conclusions? It's referred to as design for fidelity. Integration. In this context, integration which refers to the degree that you are combining appropriately your inferences from various strands or phases of the study is very much a continuum. In other words, you're contrasting, modifying, and linking sets of data throughout various phases or strands of the study. As, as you become more complex in your design, your initial interpretation then becomes more complex as you combine and integrate these particular findings per strand. That's one example, and that's based on data collected. But you can also integrate different philosophical assumptions and different methods of data collection. In other words, you're using a different philosophical assumption relative to how you're interpreting what type of data collected, dialectical, for example, pragmatic, pragmatist. And then based on that assumption, you're going to draw a conclusion relative to how these different philosophical assumptions influence the overall process of data collection. That help, works very well when you're dealing with um, researchers who do not share a similar assumption, but are able to come to some type of consensus. The fact that they have different philosophical orientations about what are important data and how to collect them, but they come to a consensus is still a form of integration. You're coming up with a different conclusion based on the mixing of these assumptions relative to interpreting your data. Integration in mixed research, the degree that it's successful, is referred to as integrative efficacy. This comes from the work of Ted Lee and Tasha Corey. Here the goal is to, to ensure that the researcher formulates theoretically consistent meta-inferences. I cannot un underscore the importance of, underscore too much the importance of having a theoretical framework within your conceptual framework. By conceptual framework, I'm referring to the variables of interest that you have selected from the literature to formulate your design, your interpretation of what are critical, your own philosophical assumption specified, and your um, all based on the literature and based on how you're interpreting the data that you're collecting. And that it then looked into what theory you're going to use in order to interpret the, the data relative to the analysis relative to the meta inference that we form. So a conceptual framework and embedded within that a theoretical framework are critical in order to interpret correctly, or interpret um, credibly 
the uh, analysis of the data that you have collected. And this is obtained from each strand. Triangulation, this is an important point. Triangulation is used such that it's almost meaningless. It's used so often. And the way to give it meaning is you go a sentence further or go a step further and define what you mean by triangulation. This is an excellent article by Baisley and Kemp. Basically, triangulation can serve the purpose of validation. Here you're looking for convergence. Your, um, the quantitative and qualitative strands, the findings from each, converge such that you get a um, confirmation that you are interpreting a phenomena appropriately given the multiple forms of evidence that support your conclusions. And then the, also, it can occur when the integration of results leads to broader insights and more com complexity. That's what you're looking for. Another purpose is diverging. This occurs when the researcher is looking for findings that contradict, leading to different types of research questions or topics to explore. In other words, you're looking to explain, expand the topic of interest to you by looking for divergent findings and then probing these findings relative to the design of another question or to another, topic, another type of topic to explore. So I think it's important that when you say triangulation, you identify what type of triangulation you are hoping to achieve relative to the research question. Politics. Here we're talking about the idea that there are certain, at times there are conflicts occurring within the interpretation of data. The conflicts can come from member checking. In other words, you draw a conclusion based on your analysis of individuals um, individuals' perceptions. Let me back up for a minute. Member checking typically occurs when you have collected your data, you transcribe it, and then you say to the individual or group, did I correctly capture the voice that you, that you expressed when you were talking about a particular phenomenon of interest? There's also member checking, too, when you draw your conclusion and you present it to the stakeholders, going back to a naturalistic generalization. Are these conclusions meaningful to your stakeholders? When there's a conflict, you have to make a decision on how you're going to respond to that conflict. Some, way, um, some ways of doing so is indicating you're right. Yes, there was a conflict in how the results were interpreted by the individuals who participated in the study. And a consensus was drawn that um, you might discuss how you do some type of consensus. Or just the fact that you mentioned it is important. Again, we're talking about the idea of transparency here. If a conflict occurs, I believe you should report it and indicate, yes, a conflict occurred when the results were shared with the stakeholders and then give an interpretation of how that influenced the overall conclusion of your study. Ethics. Again, this is very much a component of uh, the challenge that it presents is that you want to make sure that the participants' rights, voluntary participation, informed consent, et cetera, are respected within the sampling uh, decisions that you make throughout the study. And basically, um, you also want to be sure that your sampling and design allows you to achieve credible outcomes and generalizations, but you need to respect the ethical component of that process. This comes from the work De Tallow, 2010. He does an excellent job in expressing the importance of ethics and sampling design. Again, some final thoughts. A sampling design can make or break your study. You could do everything right, and I put right quotations around it, but if you don't have adequate power, you would not be able to ascertain a statistically significant difference such if such does exist within the sample. Uh, if you do not sample appropriately, the characteristics of interest that will allow you to interpret a theoretically appropriate meta-inference will be invalid because you did not simply you did not sample appropriately the characteristics of interest to you. It's very important to reflect on that relative to your data source and to provide interpretation to your audience as to the rationale for why you select a particular sample, why you, um, and why you select a particular number to sample, what characteristics were of interest to you in the particular sample, and what theory guided your selection of these characteristics relative to your research question. Um, again, also it reflects your interpretation about what is our credible data. Currently, when I discuss and present my thoughts in an article, I indicate to the reader what are my perceptions of data 
And how do these perceptions influence the content written within this particular article? I think the same can be said when one collects data for a particular study. I think it's important to select your philosophical orientation about who you are as a researcher and why you selected this particular topic and why your sampling design was, was selected based on how you intend to interpret the results of your study. Before we go into comments or collect over a few more minutes, I just wanted to go through, these are some of the references that I think will be of interest to you. Some of them are available online, some of them are available through interlibrary loan, and some are available on ResearchGate. I just urge you to expand the comments that I have made in this presentation to look at some of these different sources. I find them to be extremely useful as I teach and discuss uh, sampling. Anyway, I'm within three minutes. Your thoughts? Perfect. Thank you very much, Kathleen, for that wonderful presentation. Um, so if anyone has any questions at this time, you can raise your hand and I can give you the microphone and you can tell us your name, where you're from, and then ask your question. If you don't have a microphone, then you can just type your questions into the chat below. I couldn't have been that good. <laughs> okay, so looks like Peter's raised his hand. So I'll see if I can give you the microphone. Hello? Oh, hello. Yep, yeah, go ahead, Peter. All right. Uh, greetings, everybody. Thank you for the lecture. I'm Peter from Nigeria. Mm -hmm. I just quickly want to ask if the, this recording will be available so we could go through it uh, later time. Yes. Getting... Yes, it will. I'm going to give the uh, permission to you to post the overheads and the um, vocals. That would be fine. Perfect. Okay. Um, yeah. And secondly, you know, actually, just an observation. Uh, some of us are actually new to uh, this uh, research general method and all those stuff. You know, uh, you were kind of fast. Mm. I I, thought I couldn't catch up very. Uh, I, you know, I couldn't catch up with you. But uh, perhaps when I go through the recording again, I will get a better. Also, um, I just want to stress That's that I basically just took the highlights from the reference list. I strongly urge yes. you to go through the references and read it yourself. And then, and as you read it, I think what I have said will be, um, there'll be more clarity yeah. to it. I realized I went through it fast. I, I caught myself yes. because I only had 45 minutes and I wanted to make sure I touched yeah, on each of those. But I apologize for that. But hopefully it'll still make sense to you as you go through it. Maybe you can slow it down and then again, do some of the reading. The reading's critical. There's not enough in this presentation to give you the basis without doing the reading. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And so one more thing. Is this going to be a continuous? Shall we continue to have opportunity for lectures or it's a one-off uh, presentation? There, there'll be different topics presented by uh, individuals within the field. For example, the, um, Joe Maxwell is doing one on tomorrow, next week on December 6th. I don't remember his topic at the moment. But yes, this will be an ongoing um, presentation style, meaning individuals within the mixed research community will present um, a 45 minute lecture followed by questions on different topics of interest within the mixed research, uh, mixed research as a whole. Okay. Does that answer your question? All right. Yes, to, act, um, to keep at pace with uh, the presentations, you know, mm -hmm. um, like I was lucky to get this link mm -hmm. um, from my university. Mm -hmm. Um, link. It was posted on the university link, my online master's program. But then I would like to ask if uh, maybe where can I, maybe the link, or I want to be more engaged. I don't want to miss out mm -hmm. such presentation. Is there a website where I can be getting updates, um, you have, personal updates you have, on the mm -hmm. workshops? Yes. You have some options. You can go to the MIRA work, uh, website, M-M-I-R-A dot com and Please, M please, can it be typed? Oh, sure. I'm, I'm not getting it. Is it something you can type on the chat box so I can get it clear? Actually, you know where, if you look on the very first, uh, oh, I don't think I put it in there. How, how do I, do I just, oh, here we go. Yeah, no. okay. 
Um, she'll type that in for you, Peter. Um, as well, the um, IAQM website will have the slides and the presentation as well. You can go back because this is the third year that we've done webinars with Mira. So we've got um, three years of recorded webinars that you can go through and watch. Great. Okay. okay. All right. Perfect. That would be great. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. And next, I believe we had um, Keith. Keith King had a question. Okay. Keith, go ahead. Keith, did you have a microphone? Yeah, sorry about that. No worries, go ahead. Hey, Keith from the University of Alberta. I just was wondering, early on you talked about epistemological and ontological um, like frame mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. mixed methods. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering about if you thought there were a couple of uh, frames or theorists that lend themselves better to mixed methods work as someone sort of early in my career in terms of advanced reading in that area? The, the pragmatist perspective indicating that one selects strategically different methods with the goal of addressing optimally the research question tends to be prevalent in the mixed research community. However, there's dialectical perspective where one takes into account different tensions that occur when you use a variety of different perspectives and how these tensions allow one to elaborate more appropriately on terms of sample selection and not sample, just design, et cetera, in, in reaching the research question. An excellent source would be um, Burke Johnson's work. If you put in, uh, go to the um, Journal of Mixed Method Research and put in Burke Johnson. He has written articles on this particular topic. Um, another source would be Jennifer Green, 2007, her textbook. It's a little older now, which has an excellent chapter. And I believe I have that in my references. It has an excellent chapter that will allow, give a very detailed interpretation of the variety of different perspectives and how one as opposed to the other might resonate for you. And that's the approach I would take in order to start the process. Wonderful. Thank oh, you're you. welcome. Oh, sorry, a couple questions from the chat. So Mohamed Asani, or Amini Farsani, sorry, thanks. Please talk about some fresh line of research with regards to mixed message research sampling. Okay, I'm sorry, what was the question? Where was it? Please, um, please talk about some fresh line of research with regards to mixed methods research sampling. What do you mean by fresh research? I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, Mohammed, if you're still there, if you could elaborate on that. Um, next, we'll go to Fiza. What do you think of uh, Guba and Lincoln audit trail about proving your qual data collection is trustworthy? Well, first of all, the idea of proof, proof usually refers to you trying to prove your opinion. The preferred term is provide evidence. In other words, to what degree can you provide evidence that your data is reflective of the voice of the individual that you are um, engaged with in that particular um, study. The audit trail is a way of, of creating um, a transparent, transparent process indicating how you acquired your data and to what degree have you, have you um, indicated that it's valid relative to your particular research question. And again, member checking would be an example of that. In other words, even though there's a subjective interpretation of your data, of the data collected, you're still involving the participant and verifying that you have, as they say, captured the voice relative to that particular individual. Um, other ways of thinking about capturing the voice that could also be an audit trail is that some researchers, and I'm advocating this, and my colleagues and I have done this, is that at the conclusion of the study, you are debriefed by a peer. Again, it, it provides an indication of what to sit, the rationale behind your decisions and to articulate any difficulties you occurred, that occurred within your collection and analysis of the data. In other words, there could be a series of questions that are asked from a colleague to the researchers that would then provide a snapshot of the, of the researcher's process of thinking throughout that particular study. That's another example of an audit trail. As far as dissertation work, when I'm on a committee, I strongly advocate that the individual who completed the study, who completed the dissertation, have a debriefing interview as a form of validity. 
And the validity check here would be what decisions did you make? What was your rationale for various types of decisions? Any problems that occurred in data collection and how did you address these problems? It gives another avenue of expression relative to validating that you have obtained your, how you obtained your data and how you interpret it in, through the analysis. I hope I answered your question. Is that the direction you were thinking about? Perfect. Oh, okay. And we'll move on to Marcy Antonio. Can you go through a bit more details on considering general generalizability, transferability for exploratory studies, or are there specific references in this list that you would suggest? Um, I would look at Firestone and Kennedy, especially Kennedy, referred to as case-to-case -case transfer. I would use that as a source. Also, an excellent resource is the Miles um, Huberman and Saldana text. They discuss um, the importance of what is generalization relative to qualitative data and interpreting it. Also, um, those are the sources I would start with relative to thinking about um, excuse me, thinking about generalization. Also, stake, 2005. When I'm teaching, my students are rather fascinated by the idea that one could have a naturalistic generalization. They've never heard of that concept before. But again, case to case would be Kennedy, and also um, Yin would be another source, Yin 2009, 2014 on case to case research. He talks about what is case to case generalization. These are the sources I would start with relative to the top of thinking about it more. Um, expansively. Okay, and next we have Sophia Ramming. Um, in a grounded theory method approach, when a study is investigating critical cases and there is an attempt to get a broad sample but only a small number of participants agree to the nested sample, what is your opinion on drawing conclusions from the smaller sample? I guess it depends on what the question is, research question. And for example, sometimes smaller samples, especially you're getting at hard to reach samples, individuals who may have a, um, are difficult to contact. Um, you, the idea is, for example, if you were working with um, individuals who have su suffered some type of trauma, they're less likely to divulge their status, making it more difficult to connect with these individuals in order to do interview, intervention, et cetera. So I think it very much depends on the topic of interest and what the characteristics that you are exploring if make, and that will allow you then to make a decision on the degree that you can um, generalize. I think also looking at that Guest Bunce and Johnson 2006 article, it's in the references, I think will give it another level of interpretation as what does it mean to get to saturation and then use that as a basis for granted theory, what would be appropriate for granted theory. I'm thinking about it. Again, using Burke Johnson's name again, he has done an excellent, he wrote an excellent article with, uh, Turner, oh, let's see, I think it was Johnson and Turner. But if you put in grounded theory and Burke Johnson's name, I believe that article will pop up and that might be another way of thinking about how to um, think about grounded theory relative to sampling. Okay, and our next question comes from Suda Pingle. Hi, Kathleen. Can you explain more on uh, legitimation criteria? Legitimation is, a, is a, as I mentioned earlier, is a term that was um, defined by Johnson and Amwebuzi, Amwebuzi and Johnson, rather, 2006. It was designed to give another name for validity and transferability or trustworthiness that was not specifically reflected of a quantitative or qualitative um, paradigm. But basically, legitimation is the degree that you have created a legitimate validity design. In other words, what have you done in your study to allow you to draw credible conclusions? I would start with the Onway Boozy and Johnson 2006 article, and I have that in the reference list, and look at the nine criteria and think about those relative to your sampling, relative to your overall design decisions. I also um, would suggest that you read Collins 2015, it's Validity and Multi-Method and Mixed Research. In there, I did a review of the validity literature and came up with ideas on how to craft a mixed, excuse me, craft a validity design, which would be a means of addressing legitimation within a mixed research study. I think these sources will help provide a framework for interpreting legitimation. 
Okay, so we do still have a few more quest or a few more uh, minutes. If anyone else has a last question they would like to ask Kathleen. Um, as she mentioned before, we do have one more webinar coming up for 2018, and that's on December 6th at 10 a.m. Mountain Standard Time, and that's Joseph Maxwell, and his topic will be demonstrating causation in mixed methods research. So the link for the registration is up on the IAQM site, iaqm.uberta.ca. Uh, so you can go register for that, um, taking place in a couple weeks. So if anyone else has any questions, we've got a few minutes left. Okay, another one uh, from Sophia. Any idea on the beginning of the Johnson Grounded Theory article? You no, know, I, I drawing a blank on the year, but I do think if you, um, I believe, I believe it was published in Journal of Mixed Method Research. So if you go to JMMR, their website, and on the top you can put in searching within the journal for the name Burke Johnson, and it should pop up. If not, then I would go to uh, Google Scholar and see what comes up. I just don't have, I don't, it's not coming to the, my mind at the moment. Okay, and we do have a question from Tao Ting Lee. How would you handle qualitative data with poor quality, i.e. transcripts with um, inaudible pieces? I would collect more data. That's how simple it is. I mean, if you can't interpret it, and there's a possibility that you are hearing something that isn't, necessarily true relative to what was said by the individual and its useless data. And I would collect more data. Okay, another one from Suda Pingle. Will the philosophical assumption of the researchers affect, a researcher affect the interpretation of results? I, th I think to a certain degree, yes, because basically your philosophical orientation relative to what, how you interpret data and how you collect and analyze data and what you believe to be a credible sampling design and research design will reflect how you, in, it's, it's interpreting results is very subjective. And yes, you build in design um, checks to ensure that there is credibility relative to your conclusions, but it's very much based on who you are as a researcher. For example, I'm not the same researcher I was 10 years ago. I've changed based on my experiences, and that will in, that will change how I the questions that I ask now, the means by which I address these questions, and how I interpret the results. So yes, I do believe that being a researcher is an evolving process, and I believe that it influences how you interpret results relative to what you're looking at, and more importantly, what types of questions you're asking. Okay, sounds good. A lot of thank yous, always good to hear. All right, so we have time for one last question, if anyone can write it quickly or raises their hand quickly. Um, oh. <laughs> Otherwise, I uh, just want to say thank you to everyone for attending. Uh, it's your attendance and support that lets um, us put on these webinars every month. So I hope you'll continue to join us every month and lend your support. Um, Kathleen, did you have any final words? I, I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you very much for listening so carefully. Perfect. All right, so 159, we'll go ahead and end there. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Take care, and we'll hopefully see you next month.